Okay, so we're scooting on to a new topic, anti-differentiation. So in this particular lecture video, we're going to go backwards. You've seen some of the other lecture videos where we were taking the derivative. In this section, we're going backwards. We're taking the anti-derivative. We're given the derivative, and now we need to go backwards to find the actual function that it came from. Got it? We're given the derivative, and we need to go backwards to find the original function that we were working with. Cool? Okay. So, first let me talk about a theorem. This theorem deals with the rules for anti-differentiation. <coughs> Excuse me. And C is considered the constant of integration in, this, in these rules, these four rules we're talking about. So, the first rule is known as the constant rule. So, first things first. You see this little squiggly line? As soon as you see that, it automatically tells you to take the antiderivative, to anti-differentiate the, the, the problem it's giving you. So, in this particular case, you're asking me when I see this integral sign, that's what it's actually called. So let me put this up here. This little symbol is known as an integral. So, when we're working with this integral sign, it's saying take the antiderivative. So, they're asking me to take the antiderivative of k with respect to x. The dx says with respect to x. So, k is a constant because there's no x next to it. k is also the derivative. So, now I need to go backwards and find the original function that this derivative came from. Now, mind you, as we go over these rules, you're going to be like, how did they get these? They saw a pattern in problems that were the same. They kept seeing the same pattern over and over and over again. And when they saw the pattern enough times, they knew, ah, that's how I'm going to go backwards. So if I'm given the derivative as a constant, and they're asking me to go backwards, taking the antiderivative with respect to x. The antiderivative is going to be k times x plus c. Now, c is a constant of integration. It's a number. I don't know what the number is. It just represents some number. Cool? So this is the original function. And if I take the derivative of this function with respect to x, I would get k. If I want to check my work, that's what I would have to do. Good? Okay, number two is known as the power rule. So in this particular case, my derivative is x to the n. How do I know that? Because I see the integral sign here, and that integral sign says to take the antiderivative to go backwards. So if I'm looking for the antiderivative of x to the n with respect to x, this is what it looks like. 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1 plus C. C, again, is some constant. Don't know what it is. Don't care what it is. One thing I need to make note of is that n cannot be equal to, and I messed up right there, can't be equal to a negative 1. Because if it's equal to a negative 1, well, then this thing becomes a 0, and now we're up a creek. Cool? Okay. Let's look at the third one. This third one is known as the natural logarithmic rule. Now, 1 over x is the derivative. How do you know? That's right. You see the integral sign. So this integral sign says take the antiderivative of 1 over x with respect to x. And when I do that, the original function is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Again, c is a constant. doesn't matter what it is. Now, some of you may be going, well, why do I have absolute value signs in here? Remember, the domain of a natural log function, its domain is from 0 to infinity, not including 0, which is why you need the absolute values around that x, because I need to make certain that that remains a positive number, greater than 0. Cool? Okay, last rule for now known as the exponential rule, and the uh, base on it is e. So I'm talking about, I'm actually talking about a natural exponential. 
So I'm taking the antiderivative of e to the ax with respect to x. And when I do that, I end up with 1 over a times e to the ax plus c, some constant. Notation, a can't be 0, otherwise things blow up. It's undefined. That doesn't work for us. Good? Okay. I have one more theorem, and then after that theorem, we're going to get into some examples. So I'll be right back. Let's look at this next theorem. This next theorem is talking about the properties of anti-differentiation. So, the first property is a constant factor. If I'm taking the antiderivative of a function multiplied by a constant, then it would be the same thing as if I factored the constant out and put it in front, and then took the antiderivative of the function. We've done things like that before. Say we were going to factor a polynomial. One of the first things we do is we look for the greatest common factor, correct? And if there is a number that's in common with all of them, we factor it out, and then we look at the rest of the polynomial, what's left over, and it's easier to take or to factor it, right? Same thing here. It's easier, if there's a common factor, it's easier to pull it out, be it only a number, okay, c is a number, it's a constant, c is a number, it's easier to factor a number out, then take the antiderivative of the function, and then if I'd like to, multiply that constant back in. I'm reducing it basically, it just makes life easier. Cool? All right. Number two is if I'm taking the antiderivative of a sum or a difference. So if I'm taking the antiderivative of the sum of two functions with respect to x, the sum is very nice to us because what it will let us do, it will let us pull the two functions apart. It will allow me to take the antiderivative of f of x with respect to x, take the antiderivative of g of x with respect to x, and then add the two together again. So it's kind of nice. Now remember, antiderivative is going backwards. Remember when we took the derivative of a polynomial? Didn't we take the derivative of each term individually? Same thing. Now, if I'm working with a couple of polynomials, I'm able to take the antiderivative individually, and it makes life easier. Good? Okay, so let's get into a couple of examples of taking the antiderivative. So let's look at the first one. The first one is telling me to take the antiderivative of x to the power of 6. So they want me to go backwards. x to the 6 is the derivative. And they're like, well, what was the original function? Since this is a power, I'm going to go back and look at that power rule. And that power rule tells me, right, it says to do 1 over n plus 1 times x to the power of n plus 1, right? So in this particular case, I would do 1 over 6 plus 1 times x to the 6 plus 1 plus some constant c. With me? All right. So when we simplify this, we get 1 over 7 x to the 7 plus some constant c. Good? This is the original function. This was the original function that we took the derivative of to get x to the power of 6. Check it. Check the work. See if you agree. I'm just going to go up here because I have more room. If they ask me to take the derivative of 1 over 7, x to the 7th plus some constant c, what's the first thing I do to take its derivative? Yeah, I'm going to take the 1 7th, I'm going to bring this power down, and then I'm going to subtract by 1, aren't I? Let me just write 7 minus 1. And the derivative of a number is just, yeah, 0, so that's not going to do anything. So I've got 1 over 7 times 7 times x to the 7 minus 1, which gives me x to the power of 6. Notice when I take the derivative, I'm subtracting. When I'm going backwards, taking the antiderivative, I'm adding. Cool? Okay. So, how about number 2 here? 
They're asking me to take the antiderivative of x to the power of 8 with respect to x. That's right. This is another power. So to do this, right, I wrote down the power rule over here. I do 1 over 8 plus 1 times x to the 8 plus 1 plus c. You always need to remember that constant c. And I know you're going, why? Well, you know, there may have been a constant in the original function, and there may not have been, but I don't know that for sure. So I always need to write this constant c in here just in case it had one. Later we'll figure out if it really did or didn't. But for now, I need to be very generic about it. I need to put that c in there just in case the original function have one, had one. Good? Okay, so when I simplify this, that's right, that's 1 over 9 times x to the 9 plus a constant c. Check it. Pause the video, check it. See if we get x to the 8th again. I bet you do. Got some more examples for us. Be right back. So let's look at example three. Antiderivative, right? They, uh, they gave me the integral. So they're asking me to take the antiderivative of x to the power of one fourth. So it is a power rule. Even though the power is a fraction, it's still a power, isn't it? Okay, so that means, what are we gonna write? One over n, which is one fourth, plus one, times x to the one-fourth plus one plus c. Agreed? Okay. And then, yeah, you've got to add that, don't you? So, let me just give myself a little bit more board space. If I have room on the board still, I'll come back to that problem. So, one-fourth plus one. Stay off the calculators. Come on, one-fourth plus one. Good, five-fourths. So one over five-fourths times x to the five-fourths, because we just did it, one-fourth plus one, plus c. Okay, so now you've got this complex fraction, one divided by five-fourths. Okay, so how do you do that? Yeah, let me just kind of do a little side work here at the bottom. This is 1 divided by 5 fourths, isn't it? Which becomes 1 times the reciprocal, which is why this becomes 4 fifths in front, doesn't it? Times x to the 5 fourths plus c. Cool? Good. Check the work if you want to. Remember, to check this, you bring the power down, reduce it by 1, and the derivative of a constant is zero, so do I come up with x to the one-fourth? I really do. Yeah, I really do. Okay, problem number four. You're like, wait, that's a fraction. You're right, it is a fraction. So, one over x to the fifth. I don't know how to deal with a fraction, but if it's a power like this, I know how to deal with it. And then some of you are going, yeah, but what about that other rule where it had the antiderivative of 1 over x? That's true. But that was x to the power of 1, wasn't it? So, I need another way of writing 1 over x to the fifth, so it's not a fraction. Come on, I know you know it. What are you guys getting? Ah, that's it. I heard somebody out there. I'm taking the antiderivative of x to the negative fifth power with respect to x. Good? Okay. This is a power. I don't care that the power is negative. I don't care that the power is fraction. The power rule is the power rule. I am going to take 1 over the power, which is negative 5, and add 1 to it. This is what the power rule tells me to do when I'm taking the antiderivative. Times x to the power plus 1. That's right, plus c. Put the plus c there. If you don't put the plus c there, it's not quite right. Now get points taken off. I don't want to see you get points taken off. Okay, negative 5 plus 1. Good. 1 over negative 4, x to the 
negative 4 plus c, and you could put it as negative 1 fourth with the negative out in front, which is the way we prefer it anyway, right? We don't usually have the negative in the denominator. We like the denominator to be without a negative and without a fraction. Check it if you want to. Bring the power down. Reduce by 1 with the derivative of a constant, just 0. Do I get x to the negative 5? I do. And can x to the negative 5 be rewritten as 1 over x to the 5th? It can. Have some more. Problem 5 is back. So it's asking me to take the antiderivative of the cubed root of x squared with respect to x. Now, <laughs> none of our rules deal with a radical. I don't care what the radical is. It doesn't deal with a radical. So I need to think of a way to rewrite this problem without a radical. If I can do that, it's going to make my life a whole lot easier. So I'm taking the antiderivative of what? I know x is squared, which is good, but that cubed root, I can't leave it with the radical. I don't have a rule for that. So any ideas? Yep, somebody said it. Remember, the root can be rewritten as the denominator of the power. 2 is the power, 3 is the root. Remember, you can always rewrite those radicals as a power. It's just going to give you a fraction, which is totally fine, because didn't we do something like that in problem 3? Didn't we have x to the power of 1 fourth? Yep, we sure did, didn't we? So, got an idea of how to do this? Good. So talk me through it. What do we do? Yep, 1 over, good, 2 thirds plus 1, keep talking, x to the 2 thirds plus 1. That's right, plus c. Good job. You remember the plus c. Woohoo! So, 2 thirds plus 1. Stay off the calculators. Yeah, common denominator. The 1 becomes a 3 over 3, so this is 1 over 5 thirds, isn't it? x to the 5 thirds. And so, what's 1 divided by 5 thirds? Yeah, 3 fifths. Same principle we just did in problem number 3. And this is the original function that we took the derivative of to get x to the 2 thirds. And x to the 2 thirds can be rewritten as that radical in the original problem. Cool? Loving it. Okay. Number six. They're asking me to take the antiderivative of a polynomial with respect to t. Okay. So do I have to look at this whole thing in one chunk? Or can I look at it in separate little pieces? Yeah, I can look at it in separate little pieces, which means I can actually look at it as taking the antiderivative of 3t squared with respect to t, taking the antiderivative of negative 4t with respect to t, and taking the antiderivative of 7 with respect to t. Good. So they, uh, this is their way of getting me to do three problems in one. Isn't that lovely? So let's look at this first one. First question, that's 3 times t squared. That 3, does it have to stay there? No, good, it doesn't. Because remember uh, theorem number 3? If you have that constant in front, right, that coefficient really is what it is, not a constant. It's a coefficient, though a lot of books call them constants. I can pull the, con the coefficient out and take the antiderivative of t to the power of 2, right? Okay, so let's do that. I'm going to have this 3 on the outside, and then what? Yes. And I'm putting it in parentheses because I'm taking the antiderivative of t squared. So 1 over 2 plus 1, t to the 2 plus 1, right? Yes, plus the c. What's going to happen here? 
Yeah, that's 1 over 3, isn't it? This becomes 3 times 1 third times TQ plus C, and doesn't this cancel? So really, the antiderivative is just T to the third plus C. Cool? Okay. Let's look at this next one. That negative 4, should it stay there? Nope, I can pull the coefficient out in front and take the antiderivative of just t. So, we have negative 4 times, good, 1 over 1 plus 1, because that's its power, times t to the 1 plus 1, yeah, plus a c, which gives me negative 4 times a half, t to the second, which gives me, good, these guys reduce to a negative 2, t squared plus a constant. Agreed? Check it. Take the antiderivative, or take the derivative of it, excuse me. Wouldn't I still get a negative 4t? Take the derivative of, and let me just write this over here. This is just going to be t to the third plus c. Take the derivative of t to the third. Don't I just get 3t squared? Lovely. Last one. Need to take its antiderivative. Right? Okay. It's a constant, isn't it? Good. So according to the constant rule, this just becomes 7t plus c. Right? Okay. Time to put it all together. So, when I took the antiderivative of 3t squared minus 4t plus 7, what did we get? The first part gave us a t cubed. The second part gave me a negative 2t squared. The last part gave me a 7, a positive 7t. Now here's the deal. It's not plus c plus c plus c. This was one problem. So it's going to be just a constant, whatever that constant is. Cool? I'm not going to add three c's to it. I'm just going to add a constant to it because this was a single problem. But it's a good habit to get into to keep writing that c there. With me? <laughs> no surprise. Got some more. Let's look at problem number seven. Problem number seven is still a power, right? But it's different because the x is in the exponent and my base is now in e. So this is an exponential with a base e, isn't it? So go back and look at that theorem two. Yeah, that was like, I think, what? There are rule number four when we have the base e. So what does it tell you to do? One over what? Yeah, one over the coefficient of x, which is 6, agree, times e to the 6x, and then plus that constant, right? You're like, wait, that's too easy. Well, so be it. Check it. If you take the derivative of e to the 6x times 1, 6, the derivative of e is just e, so you're going to get e to the 6x, right? Ah, but then you got to take the derivative of the exponent, which is 6, which will cancel out the 1, 6. Gives me right back to the original problem. Cool? Yeah, that one was kind of nice. That one was kind of easy for us. Yay! Hey, we're allowed to have those. Number 8. Okay, 2 times e to the 5x. What are you going to do? Pull the 2 out. Good job. Get that 2 out of there. I don't need to look at it. I just really need to know the derivative of e to the 5x with respect to x. So, yep, 2, and in parentheses, 1 over the coefficient of x, which was 5, or is, I should say, times e to the 5x, right, plus the c, so this gives me 2 fifths e to the 5x plus c, doesn't it? Cool. 
And if you need to take the, the, if you need to check this, take the derivative of this to make certain that you get the original problem, then by all means, pause the video and do that. Make sure that you get this, this answer again. Because remember, they're giving us the answer. They need us to go backwards and come up with the original problem. Got it? Okay. I have room for number nine. Wasn't sure if I was going to, so I'm going to put number nine up on the board right now. I'm taking the antiderivative of four-fifths e to the negative 10x, and I'm taking the antiderivative with respect to x. Okay, what are we going to do? Yeah, get that four-fifths out of there, first and foremost. So when I do that, the four-fifths is going to get pulled to the outside. So I'm, all I'm doing is taking the antiderivative of e to the negative 10x with respect to x. Okay, four-fifths is staying on the outs. How do I take the antiderivative of e to the negative 10x? Good. 1 over the negative 10, the coefficient of x, e to the negative 10x plus c. Correct? Okay. So now we get to multiply these two guys together. You got a couple of fractions, multiply them, reduce it. Bottom line, what do we get? Good. Negative 2 over 25 e to the negative 10x plus c. Awesome. Y'all with me on this? Love it. And by the way, before you move on, again, pause the video, take the derivative of this, make sure you get the original problem, take the derivative of this, make sure you get the original problem, take the derivative of this, make sure you get the original problem. That's how you're going to check your work to make sure you know you did it correctly. Got some more problems. All right, number 10. We're taking the antiderivative of 10 over x dx. So, first off, let me write another, write this problem another way. Could we write this as the antiderivative of 10 times 1 over x dx? Good, and I could take the 10 out, right? And couldn't I write 1 over x as x to the negative 1? Yeah, so I'm, don't write anything, just watch a second. I'm kind of making a point here. So if we do this, and then we proceed as the power rule, the 10 will stay on the outside, agreed? This becomes 1 over the power plus 1, x to the negative 1 plus 1, plus the c. Do you notice this is going to become a 0? which 1 over 0, which is undefined, isn't it? Yeah. So when I have got x being to the power of 1 in the denominator, it's not a power rule. Because if I try to anti-differentiate anti it with respect to the power rule, I end up with 1 over 0, and I end up with something that's undefined, which isn't going to work very well. So... Go back and look at your rules on theorem 2. When you take a look at those rules, 1 over x to the power of 1, yeah, 1 over x to the power of 1 is going to give me a natural log, isn't it? So, this 10 is coming out, and I'm taking the antiderivative of 1 over x dx, which is going to give me 10 times the natural log of x in absolute values plus c. Cool? Yeah, that's why this 1 over x doesn't behave according to the power rule. Because if I try to use the power rule on it, I get 1 over 0, and I get an undefined, which doesn't work very well in terms of make or finding the original problem. I can't take the derivative of something that's undefined. That doesn't make much sense. Good? Okay, number 11, yep, kind of the same thing, isn't it? I can take the 2 on the outside, and I'm taking the antiderivative of 1 over x dx, aren't I? Which is going to be 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Great. By the way, you remember why you put the absolute values there? 
Good, because the domain of a log function, be it natural log or otherwise, is always 0 to infinity, excluding the 0. You can only take the natural log of positive numbers, not including 0. Good? Okay. I actually have room for number 12. So, we're going to put number 12 on the board, and we're going to work that one out together. So, number 12 looks like they're asking us to take the antiderivative of 4 over x squared plus 7 over x dx. All right. So what are you going to do? Good. Split it apart first. Loving it. That's a good way to get this one started. So you're going to take the antiderivative of 4 over x squared dx. And you're also going to take the antiderivative of 7 over x dx. Talk to me about this one. Good. The 4 is going to come on the outside. And you can write this as x to the negative 2 dx, can't you? Good job. So let's finish with this one before we move on. So, good. 4 times 1 over negative 2 plus 1, x to the negative 2 plus 1, and then plus a constant. We'll get to that guy in a second. So what is it going to happen here? Good. 4 times, yeah, that fraction is just going to become negative 1, isn't it? x to the negative 1, which is basically negative 4 times x to the negative 1, or it can be rewritten as negative 4 over x, couldn't it? Awesome. This second part, yeah, take the 7 on the outside, the antiderivative of 1 over x dx, and you're like, okay, that's like 10 and 11. That's right, it's like 10 and 11. So we have 7 times the natural log of the absolute value of x, don't we? Okay, so let's put these two answers together, shall we? So the antiderivative becomes negative 4 over x plus 7 natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Right? Right. With me? Got some more. Here's 13. Looks like a doozy, right? Okay, so my recommendation is don't write anything down. Just follow along or pause the video. Work it out on your own and then see if you agree with me. All right? Here we go. I have got an addition problem here, which means I am going to take three separate antiderivatives. And the first one I'm going to start with is that first term. So, first on my list, I'm going to take the antiderivative of 4 over the fifth root of x dx. See if you follow along. The 4 is going to get taken out, and it's going to be written as 1 over x to the 1 fifth dx, right? Because I can rewrite the fifth root. And so I'm taking 4 times the antiderivative of x to the negative 1 fifth dx. And so, here we go. 4 times 1 over negative 1 fifth fifth plus 1, x to the negative 1 fifth plus 1. The plus c comes at the end, right? Because I'm going to take three antiderivatives and then add the c at the end. Okay, so 4 times 1 over, yeah, that's 4 fifths, x to the 4 fifths. Simplify this out a little bit. 4 times, good, 5 over 4, good job, x to the 4 fifths, which is going to give me on the first one, 5x to the 4 fifths as the antiderivative of term number 1. You okay with that? All right, number 2, our second term, we're taking the antiderivative 
of 3 fourths e to the 6x. So, that's right, 3 fourths comes out. I'm taking the antiderivative e to the 6x. That's right, that's an exponential with a base e. So, we're going to have 1 over the coefficient of x times e to the 6x. And when I simplify this, that's right, 3 and 6, right? That'll be 1 eighth e to the 6x. So here is number 2, or term number 2 is antiderivative. Do you agree? And there's term number 1's antiderivative. Got one more term, don't we? The antiderivative of negative 7 over x dx. So, good, take out the negative 7. I'm taking the antiderivative of 1 over x. Since this x has a power of 1, do I use the power rule? Good, you don't. You use the natural log rule. Excellent. And there is the antiderivative of term number 3. Ready to put it all together for the final answer? All right. Finally, we have first term, the antiderivative is 5x to the 4 fifths plus 1 eighth x to the 6x. Ooh, not x. See, we're so used to writing x as a base. e to the 6x minus 7 natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Did you get the same thing? I hope you did. Cool. Okay, so, so far, these 13 problems, we've been having this plus c at the end, right? It was some generic constant that could have been in the original problem. We just don't know. I'm going to do a couple of problems where we're going to actually determine the constant. And if the constant's not supposed to be there, it'll work out to be a zero. So, I'll be right back. Look at the directions. Find f such that they gave me f prime equals x minus 3. So, f prime is the derivative, isn't it? And they said f of 2 equals 9. All right. So, first and foremost, they said find f. I need to find the original function. And they gave me the derivative, didn't they? So if they gave me the derivative, what do I need to do to go from the derivative to the original function? Yeah, antiderivative, just like we did on the last 13 problems, right? We've got to take the antiderivative. So we need to take the antiderivative of x minus 3 dx. It's a difference problem, so I take them individually, don't I? All right. So, antiderivative of x, see if you follow along, right? That's basically going to be 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 1 half x squared. Agreed? And then the antiderivative, I'm just going to put a minus here, of 3x. So, that's going to be minus 3x. So, minus 3x plus c. This is f of x, isn't it? This is your original function, isn't it? Now, a notation that we normally don't write, but really we should, we should really write f of x equals this antiderivative. So what we have just given ourselves is f of x equals 1 half x squared minus 3x plus c. There is f of x. Y'all with me? That's how we get it, with the antiderivative. Cool? Okay. But then they gave me this part, too. They said, and I'm writing the word since, since f of 2 equals 9, and I have f right here, what's the 2 represent? It represents the x's. What does that 9 represent? It represents the output, doesn't it? It represents this 
why, so to speak. Correct? So, what do you think you're going to do with the 2 and the 9? Plug it in. So, I'm going to have 9 equals 1 half, 2 squared, minus 3 times 2, plus C. What do you think we are going to find given this X and this Y? We're going to find the constant. We're going to find out if there really was a constant in the original problem or not based upon that information. With me? All right. So, just get your algebra going here, right? 1 half times 4 minus 6. 9 equals 2 minus 6 equals negative 4 plus 6. 13 equals C. Looks like there was a C in the original problem, and it turned out to be 13. Which means, therefore, that's what those three little dots mean, in case you didn't know that, F of X is equal to 1 half X squared minus 3X plus 13. That was the original function. Took the antiderivative first, because they gave me the derivative. Second, since they gave me an x and a y, I could plug it in and determine what c was equal to. Good? Awesome. I got another one of these, so I'll be right back. All right. This problem, same directions. Find f such that this derivative and this piece of information are both satisfied. So we need to find f, don't we? What did they give us? They gave us the derivative. So how do we go from the derivative to the actual function? Yeah, we have to take the antiderivative. So f of x is going to equal the antiderivative of this second degree polynomial, isn't it? And I'm taking it with respect to x, correct? Okay, now, gratefully it's a sum and difference, so I can look at them separately, can't I? All right, so I am going to look at them separately, see if you follow along. We're taking the antiderivative of 5x squared dx. I'm taking the 5 out. I'm dealing with a power, so I have 1 third x to the third. Like, wait, how'd you go from here to here? Pause the video. You're right, I skipped a step. I didn't show the 1 over 2 plus 1, x to the 2 plus 1. So pause the video and make sure you know how I went from here to here. Got it? Okay. So my first antiderivative will be 5 thirds x to the power of 3. Second one. We are taking the antiderivative, right, there's a plus, of 3x. So I'm going to pull out that plus, that 3, whoops, and that's with respect to x. And then, pause the video, go find the antiderivative of x, and then start it up again, because all I'm going to do is write the answer for the antiderivative of x. Got it? Okay, I got 1 half x squared. Did you? Yay! So plus 3 halves x squared. And then minus the antiderivative of 7 with respect to x. So we're going to get minus 7x. So this is minus 7x and then plus the c at the end. Yes? So here's what we have found for the antiderivative. Here's what we have found for x so far. Is this third degree polynomial 5 thirds x cubed plus 3 halves x squared minus 7x plus c. Hopefully we agree on that. Do we? Love it. And now, we didn't use this piece of information yet. It says f of 0 equals 9. So what are you going to do? What does that 0 represent? Good, the 0 represents x, the 9 represents y, 
So then, that piece of information is now going to help me set up this equation. 9 is going to be equal to 5 thirds times 0 cubed plus 3 halves times 0 squared minus 7 times 0 plus C. Well, this looks really nice. 9 is equal to, first term is a 0, second term is a 0, third term is, so 9 equals C. Really nice for us to work with, right? Didn't even have to deal with the fractions. Everything zeroed out. So finally, got our, got our original polynomial, got our f of x. We do. We have now found that f of x, and I'm going to write it down here at the bottom, f of x is equal to 5 thirds x cubed plus 3 halves x squared minus 7x plus 9, since we found 9 was equal to c. Got it? Love it. Okay, we got some stories coming up, so hang in there.